No one is the beloved of God, taken from the incarnation of love. The Adidas Sandwich. Chapter 8. A Conversation. Bruce Burnham. Sri Gurudev. Recently I made a decision to move out of the household where I have been living because my relationship or lack of it with one of the people there was not tenable. Alida. Why wasn't it tenable? Bruce. Because there are always so much conflict. Alida. Why is conflict not tenable? Why isn't it useful? Why isn't that a creative situation? Bruce. For quite a while I felt that it was very useful because of the heat it created for both of us. Alida. It wasn't really spiritual fire or heat because both of you became less and less involved with one another. To love when you are not loved, that is the heat of spiritual practice. The heat is not to love less and to feel unloved when you are not loved. That is not heat. That is lovelessness. I believe I have called it the avoidance of relationship. Bruce Several times this person made it very clear that she could not live in the household with me any longer and her refusal justified my departure. Alida That is probably the logic that had to appear eventually. The whole episode obviously was a dramatisation, the rehearsal of a script. Everything became inevitable. And now you are living alone. You made the emotional choice, not necessarily the intellectual one. You chose by habit to respond to being unloved by not loving. Therefore, the rest of it became inevitable. But if you had done the opposite, then that script could very well have been unnecessary. You might not have become one another's favourite human being but you could certainly have realised a human relationship. This is what you do when you are not loved. You separate yourself. And when you get similar metaphysical feelings, so that you are really not certain that you are loved by the divine either, the script continues to be one of isolation. You go inside to find the big self. You take the inward path in isolation, indulging in meditation for 15 hours a day and all the rest of it. You choose the loveless life. Do you think you are loved by me, the divine person? Do you believe that the universe is pervaded by my all-sustaining, absolute, immortal love? Bruce, I feel that in your company. Adida, apart from what you may feel by association with me in divine communion, satsang with the realizer, of course, being the cure for lovelessness recommended since ancient times. And apart from the love that you may feel is coming from any individual specifically, when you are off naked in the universe, do you feel connected to the divine through love, or are you uncertain of it? Bruce, I mainly feel in a state of shock. Alida, right. In the metaphysics of your existence, you are responding to a great woman or great being or great condition of existence by which you are not loved. Bruce, it feels now like a great tension in the heart. Alida, yes. That is the contraction of the ego, the avoidance of relationship, the collapse from the divine reality. At birth, 
when the human being individuates bodily, the apparent individual feels cut off from the divine. As a born being, you become dependent on the food source, on the sources of love in your childhood, which you are vulnerable, when you are vulnerable. But those sources are always doubtful. You always come to discover that the love and attention any being can give you is not steady, not absolute. Yet you continue to depend on such gestures. This dependence, however, enforces the sense in you that you are fundamentally disconnected, vulnerable, mortal, unloved. That is the mood of the ego contracted from the divine and in fear of annihilation. Independence is the false incident of birth. It is a disposition of a human, a human being inherits through psychological individuation and you must individuate because you are born. The third stage of life should be the time when you are unparented at last, thrown from the nest when you are guided to the point of responsibility for that presumption of independent existence, that false incident, so that you can assume your full humanity and enter into spiritual life, which is not founded on the sense that you are individuated and moving toward annihilation, to be murdered by cosmic nature. In the third stage of life, you are to become responsible for all the adaptation that you have inherited in your incarnation and to be open-heartedly connected to what sustains you in truth. It is only on the basis of this responsibility that spiritual life begins, not on the basis of the agony of your egoic life, struggling to be consoled by some vision, some relationship, some functional pleasure. Bruce, I never feel consoled by any kind of vision. Alida, you have been looking for visions, haven't you? Trying to realise some state that is completely pleasurable through meditation, perhaps. Bruce, I have always felt that I would realise such a condition only in spiritual really relationship to you. Alida, that is good, but in terms of your position in the midst of things, this reaction to being unloved is what you are all about. And of course a cure is to find me and enter into divine communion. That is the cure. Abandon the incident of the ego and realise the incident of divine communion or reconnection to the divine source condition that I reveal to you. Bruce, over time I have felt that realisation coming more and more into play. Adida, but you are still dramatising this loveless lie. You are still dependent on being loved. What you discover is not that love comes to you from infinity as from a super cosmic parent. You discover in communion with me that you are love. That is the realisation. Divine self-realisation is not a relationship to some great something that loves you. No one is the beloved of God, absolutely no one. The divine is not the kind of reality that makes beloveds out of individual beings. All beings owe their love to the divine. You do not realize the divine by finding the divine being, truth and reality at the end of a great chain, but by being wholly one with the divine so that you yourself are love. If you come to me only to get loved, expecting the blossom of my spiritual heart transmission to be projected at you, there will be no change because you will remain loveless. Divine communion begins when you love. Then not only are you connected to love, but you are it. The only way whereby you commune with the divine is by being love. Love has great strength. When it is realised most perfectly, love is Siddhi, the bright, blessing power of the divine. It is the fundamental power, the great power, when you are it, 
but not when you dissociate from it in your egoic separation and weakness. When this consideration comes down to, in your case, what this consideration comes down to in your case is that you are living the usual life of contraction, not just in a relationship here and there, but fundamentally. Your infantile reaction to being unloved is not just something that you bring into a certain few relationships. It is your philosophy. It is an interpretation of things as they are. It is an interpretation of the universe, to be loveless because you do not trust love. You are not certain of being loved and thus you cannot love. But to love is the law. You must love, regardless of the circumstance. The essential principle of the way of the heart is unobstructed feeling contemplation of me, expressed by all functions, in all relations, under all conditions. That principle is to be realised in all the complicated mechanics of your relationships and in all the esoteric developments that must, that may be given to you as the mature, as you mature in the way of the heart. Love is the principle, but love is not what you are living. You basically feel unloved, unable to depend on love. You are always reacting to the universe as a great something in which you are not loved, always protecting yourself from death. This reaction is the essential learning you must undo in order to become a human being. The way of the heart is not a matter of reading signs about yourself and going within through meditative techniques, trying to find the great absorption. That is the method of Narcissus, whose solution is further isolation. God realization is in the moment, yet it has nothing to do with the conditions that are arising in this moment. They are not it. God realization is the awakening to your true condition, which is love bliss itself, and to live it, not just to believe it, not to depend on others for it, but to realize that confidence, that overwhelming love bliss, unthreatened. That is the business of my devotees not the mediocre drama you are telling us about here. Because of your emotional adaptation, which comes early in life, you feel greatly justified in your unlove, your weakness. You realise your true manhood, male or female, when you are able to confront that contraction, when you are able to dramatise it, not to dramatise it any longer, but to grow far beyond it. Everything follows that awakening. Then you are no longer seeking divinity in the form of either your lower functions or your higher functions. All your functions are simply conditions of experience. They are not themselves the divine or the not divine. They are simply conditions of existence that are not other than the divine. They do not have the force, in other words, to separate you from me. The ego finds all kinds of consolation in the lower life and, if it can, it detaches itself from the lower life. The ego thinks that the visions within the body and above the brows are the divinity that loves you. That is simply heresy. All this nonsense about so-called spiritual life is my complaint. I have seen all those visions and they are not the divine. You might as well call your intimate partner God Your intimate partner is not the divine. He or she is not other than the divine, if you realise me most perfectly. But he or she is not independently the divine. Your intimate partner is not burdened to fulfil you absolutely, unless you make the egoic demand, which is what you tend to do. You make that demand of all your relations, high and low. Fulfil me, love me, console me. Some people feel close to God when they go to the mountains on vacation. Some people have to look into their heads to feel that they are in touch with God. Some people must be having an orgasm to feel that they are with God. But none of that in itself is God. Those experiences are only the possibilities of human bodily existence altogether, of human adaptation in the most ordinary sense. They are essential to human beings, perhaps, 
but deluding, unless you are free as the heart by virtue of most perfect inheritance in me. Only thus can you see these experiences for what they are and become the sacrifice of them. If you are not free from your egoic contraction, then you interpret all experiences as sublimatives and you become attached to them as conventional yogis or as ordinary lovers or as whatever form of attention you are animating at the moment. The key to your existence is at the heart, in feeling contemplation of me, not in the planes of experience above or below the heart, but at the heart. The condition of the heart, the profundity of your devotion to me, determines your disposition, your realisation, your understanding of every experience, high and low. That is the essential communication of my wisdom teaching. Bruce Yes, I have heard this argument many times, and yet there is just this contraction, that tension at the heart. Adida. Yes, but you are toying with all the possibilities of experience, high and low, mainly low, perhaps disposed at times to be meditative and to go up. You are dramatising this contraction, this dilemma of independent consciousness, in the form of your experiences. People look to increase their experiences all the time without being responsible for the fundamental matter. The conventional yogi in his or her so-called spiritual strategy is also a loveless individual. Bruce I always feel that it does, not, does come back to that dramatising and yet it seems that what has to be cut through is this contraction at the heart. Adida but in your case, it is like using a hair to cut through a 20-foot marble wall. You are not, not cutting through it. You are busy meditating on the problem, busy being the contraction, and therefore self-transcendence seems to be immensely difficult. But you see that there was no purifying heat of real sadhana at all in the conflict you talked to me about. It was your dramatization of being unloved and unloving. Such dramatization does not transcend anything. There may be literal heat, but it is not the heat of devotional practice of the way of the heart, not the heat of love, of sacrifice. The heat of self-transcendence is the heat that cuts through, right through self-contraction. Your activity must be the gesture of absolute certainty, not a tentative feel, weakly asking, Do you love me? Bruce, it is not even a question of that because I knew she did not. Adida, nevertheless, you asked the question and the answer was no. And so you did what seemed necessary. You left, you withdrew, you went into solitude. That is the very model of Narcissus and that is the model of your life. That is the way you have done it since childhood. That is the level of your emotional adaptation. In that case, you are not living in divine communion with me. You are living with yourself. You are meditating on yourself. You are keeping bad company. The traditional recommendation is that the primary form of practice, the one thing necessary, the essential of spiritual life, is to spend your time in the company of the realised man or woman. But such practice is not just to be sitting here in the same room with me, you must pass out of self-meditation and literally enter into communion with me. Da. Da, da. Adi Da cuts through all our nonsense, not just by self understanding not with self-understanding, but in that divine communion. For Adi Da does the work. We simply need to give him our feeling attention and he does the work. The divine does the work. We don't need to struggle. We don't need to change our egoic ways for different egoic ways. We don't need to change all of our actions for other actions. That's not to say we won't change, but we change because of love. We change in that communion with Adida Samraj. Automatic, we automatically change 
our disposition changes. He does the work. He does the purifying work. We simply need to forget ourselves in remembrance of him. I remember as a child, I, could, I find it very difficult to sit with my family in the living room, in the sitting room. I find it very awkward. I felt very conscious, self-conscious. I would even put a pillow, just remembering this, I remember this for ages, I would put a cushion next to my head. I didn't want to be seen. Can you imagine that? I wonder if that's happening right now with someone else in this world. If you don't necessarily need a cushion, a book will do. We hide ourselves. We keep avoiding relationship. I would walk out of that room and go to the piano during my teens. I would throw a fit. I would dramatise. I would become neurotic. But all of that nonsense just simply vanishes in divine communion. That connection, that heart connection. Adida often has said in the past that the nine months in the womb is the most continuous growth that any human being has done. The human grows for nine months in that womb, safely, securely, dependently, dependent entirely on that connection with the mother. But as soon as we're born, as soon as we cut that umbilical cord, then that's when the trouble starts. And we continue cutting that umbilical cord, that divine communion. We continually separate ourselves in that act of self-contraction. So it's a case of allowing God, the divine person, to do the work. God does the work. We simply need to remember the divine person as the doorway to God. And the key is giving him our feeling attention. That's the key. And sort of automatically, we are blessed with love and already happiness. Our disposition changes. Da, da, da. The incarnation of love can only happen in divine communion. And then we become love. We are love. Da. This way is not an egoic way.